something like that. It's a 64 Ford that kind of was standing on. Theodore Roosevelt, our 26th president, when he was making his arguments against any individual, any country, living a life of ignoble ease, had penned those words. And we here at the John F. Kennedy Space Center and throughout all of NASA, we dare mighty things. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joe Dowdy, Colonel of the United States Marine Corps, retired Chief of Staff of the Kennedy Space Center, and it's on behalf of our Center Director, Bob Caban, Colonel, United States Marine Corps, retired, veteran of four space shuttle missions, and our Administrator, Tony Bolden, Major General, United States Marine Corps, retired, that I welcome you to this very special place. There's a theme there, if you notice. <laughs> it's a good thing. Yep. I love all the services, but if you want something done right, <laughs> I'll love all the services. But it's not enough to just welcome you here to this special place, a special place whose name has been woven tightly in the fabric as the history of our nation. But I have to welcome you home. Welcome you home to the Kennedy Space Center. For well, I believe that a part of all of us resides here. That part of us that wants to do our mighty things. To look beyond the horizon, to understand, to grow, and to pass on to subsequent generations something better, certainly a better world than the one that we had found. I believe my journey to this place started many years ago on a bright, cold February morning in my fifth year, the year of 1962. 
five-year-old. I lived at 1428 State Street in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I was sitting in front of a black and white TV. The grainy images reflected on my young face. As I stared at the mighty rocket that stood poised on that path. And I saw a light flicker and grow in brilliance and incandescence. And I watched the mighty rocket trace a fiery path to the heavens. And I said, subconsciously uh, perhaps, I need to be a part of that. And I ran out in the front yard to see it. And then I realized maybe I ought to learn geography first. <laughs> <laughs> then I can be part of that. Where you see John Webb was going to space. And it was at that moment, I believe, that deep inside of me, a part of me found residence here. But certainly, I heard that special sound that emanates from this place for the first time. In the weeks, in months, in years to come, we would gather in front of the black and white TVs. I went to school at Franklin Elementary School there in Little Rock. It's where I met my wife in the first grade. I was 13. <laughs> <laughs> my son was in kindergarten, but that's not important. <laughs> but there at Franklin Elementary School, they rolled a single black and white TV out into the auditorium. We'd stare at the mighty rocket that was poised on the path. The grainy images reflected on our young faces. We'd watch the rockets climb into the heavens. And then, on a hot, humid night in July 1969, we were at a campground outside Six Flags Over, Texas. Big vacation for us. We gathered around a small black and white TV. All of us joined by, by the hearts. As we watched Neil Armstrong take those first steps on the moon, those grainy images reflected on all of our faces. And we heard those words, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And for those of us that lived in those days, you remember we were challenged by the young president to place a man on the moon by the end of that decade, the decade of the 60s, and return him safely again. As we all know, the young president would be felled by an assassin's bullet to fall, never more to rise, before he personally saw that challenge met, but met it was. And my question to you and to me on this day is a very simple one, but I believe vitally important one. And that question is this. Were those our best days? Was that the best that our nation can ever do? If it is, we're no longer a great nation. It's that simple. I was very fortunate in America's Corps of Marines to travel the world. Some places weren't very friendly. I experienced what Winston Churchill called the indescribable terror of being shot at and the equally indescribable thrill of being missed. <laughs> and it's <a> thrill of being missed. <laughs> but also traveled to places in their own day and own time have been great empires and great nations. And today, they celebrate all the things they used to do. And they do no longer. And as a consequence, they're no longer great nations. Where those are our best days. As I examine myself, to answer that question, one of the things I do is walk the halls quietly this place. 
and look into the quick, steady eyes of the folks that bring this place its life. And I'm very fortunate today to have some folks here with me. Steve Clark, that you'll hear from later, Deborah Crow, and up in the uh, booth is one of our young lines, Layla Dow. That's my last name. Uh, my daughter-in-law is up there, a very uh, oldest son, the one that was in kindergarten when I was in first grade. <laughs> and now he's in the second grade. He's been a long time. <laughs> and we have Shannon Bartels in the back, who retired not terribly long ago, who was our director of safety mission assurance. These folks reflect an unparalleled passion and dedication to a cause greater than themselves. These are the people who I've been able to share this stage with, this being our last time. These are the people whose virtues are near perfect. These are the people that will answer that finally important question. Well, those are best days. My answer is our best days are in front of us. That we're going to stand on the shoulders of those giants that have gone before us to explore new worlds, to understand our universe, to dare mighty things. In the region of the mind, I see us standing on a, on a hilltop, having struggled up its vertical slopes. To look into a valley has been unknown. Now, I can't take you there. I can join you there. Because it's a journey that begins in the mind, in the heart, in the soul, first and foremost. I had a great opportunity to spend six months up in the city of Washington, not too terribly long ago, live right by the Capitol. And I ride by the Capitol every morning going to NASA headquarters on my bicycle. And then return. I take my walks in the morning and the afternoon. And often I would stare at this magnificent building, the symbol of our republic. And I would marvel at how timeless it looked. For I was examining it for rents and tears in the facade to see crumble, to see decay, and it didn't see it. Looks timeless. Why? Because there was care and maintenance being conducted on that building constantly. In the same fashion, our country requires that same sort of care and maintenance and participation and engagement to fully answer that question in that way that our best days are in front of us we all have to make that journey together I'm mindful of I had great opportunities to study at Oxford a few years ago in uh, Oxford, Mississippi <laughs> 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 Large building in the middle of that beautiful campus there at Oxford. And I found out many years later it was called the library. Who knew? And emblazoned on the side of the library are the words of, from Oxford's most famous son, William Faulkner. On the occasion of his being awarded the Nobel Laureate for Literature, it says this. I believe that man will not merely endure, but will prevail. In like manner, I choose not to focus on the challenges of our times, although they are weighty and important, but to see in that the opportunity for us, this generation, to pass on to the future generation something better than we found that our best days are, in fact, in front of us. To 
tomorrow, Lord willing. Weather. It is what it is. We're all going to be gathered at Banana Creek. And we're going to hear metallic voices coming over the speakers. We're going to look at the grainy images on the monitors. We're going to stare across the wetlands at the mighty rocket that stands poised on the path. You'll join in the countdown. As it reaches its conclusion, you'll see a light flicker and grow with brilliance and incandescent. And that mighty rocket will trace the fiery path to the heavens. And as you stare with tear dimmed eyes at this magnificent sight, the sound will come rolling across the swamps to beat on your body and to find purchase deep inside of you. And then, and then, that special sound that emanates from this place that I heard those many years ago for the first time, that I've only heard of one other place, and that's on our nation's battlefields. That sound you ask? It's very simple. It's the sound of many hearts that suddenly beat as one. They beat as one in common purpose, in shared sacrifice, in devotions. They beat as one in a cause bigger than any of us. And now your heart is beating with mine and mine with yours, and none of us, none of us, will ever be the same again. It's good to be us. Mm -hmm. It's good to be us on this day, at this time, in this place. We've got work to do. We've got mighty things that we've got to dare. And we're only going to do it if we do it together. Well, we hope Godspeed on the good ship Atlantis and the men and women who brought her life. And it's just enough for me to say to y'all, welcome home. Welcome home to the Kennedy Space Center. We've been waiting on you. Thank you.
four veteran astronauts of Space Shuttle Atlantis, STS-135 mission, will fly the multi-purpose logistics module Raffaello, packed with supplies, to the International Space Station. During the 12-day flight, mission specialists will use the shuttle's robotic arm to lift Raffaello from the shuttle's payload bay and hand it off to the station's robotic arm for temporary attachment to the Harmony Node segment. Crew members will transfer hardware, experiments, and logistics from Raffaello to the space station. Atlantis also will deliver to the outside of the station an experiment to investigate the potential for robotically refueling satellites and return a failed station ammonia cooling system pump to help NASA better understand the failure mechanism and improve future pump designs. Among the other items that Atlantis will carry is a U.S. honor flag that has been flown nationwide at Ground Zero in New York City and throughout the world to honor heroes who have lost their lives while serving their community and country. After the flag returns to Earth, it will continue as a traveling memorial. The STS-135 mission is the final flight for Atlantis and NASA's last space shuttle mission. Inside Orbiter Processing Facility 1 at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, the main engines were installed on Space Shuttle Atlantis between December 7th and 9th, 2010. On July 13, 2010, the last newly manufactured external fuel tank, ET-138, was delivered to Kennedy aboard a barge from NASA's Mashu Assembly Facility near New Orleans. Originally scheduled for Endeavour's STS-134 mission, the tank was reassigned for Atlantis STS-135 mission. The tank was towed to the Vehicle Assembly Building, also known as the VAB, on July 14. The external tank delivers propellants to the shuttle main engines and absorbs the thrust pressure steering launch. Inside the VAB, the external tank was suspended and lowered for installation on a mobile launcher platform. As it was lowered, the tank slid between the solid rocket boosters already on the platform. During a process known as rollover, Atlantis was moved from its processing facility to the VAB on May 17, 2011. In the transfer aisle, Atlantis was lifted and then attached to the external tank and solid rocket boosters. With everything else in place, Atlantis began rolling out to Kennedy's launch pad 39A on May 31st at 8.42 p.m. and arrived at the pad at 3.29 a.m. the next day. The space shuttle and mobile launcher platform atop the crawler transport weigh approximately 18 million pounds and moved at less than one mile an hour. Today, Atlantis and NASA's hardworking team are ready for the last space shuttle launch ever and an extraordinary final mission to the International Space Station.
and was commander for STS-126 in November 2008. And of course, as commander, he will lead the crew of this mission. During pre-flight training at Kennedy, Ferguson shared his thoughts about the last space shuttle mission. We've been enormously busy, and, and although we've tried to pause and, and think of good ways to reflect and remember those moments, uh, I, I don't think that the full magnitude of the moment will really hit us until the wheels have stopped on the runway. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure words that we'll really be able to capture for, for the crew and for the entire shuttle workforce, uh, you know, just how much the shuttle program has meant to us for the last 30 years. Uh, we're certainly going to try to capture that. Over the course of the mission, we'll also try to appropriately recognize those folks it's a long list of people to remember, and I'm sure a lot of people will be watching. You know, we, we all want to be able to, to re remember this, and we want to be able to pass to our children, our children's children, that we were fortunate enough to be a, a part of the space shuttle. In this photo, pilot Doug Hurley inspects the windows on Space Shuttle Atlantis during the crew equipment interface test of CEIT here at Kennedy earlier this year. CEIT is the crew's time to become familiar with the layout of the cockpit as it is configured specifically for their mission. SDS-135 is Hurley's second space shuttle mission. He served as pilot on SDS-127 in July 2009. That mission delivered the Japanese exposed facility and the experiment logistics module exposed section to the station. To the station. Well, in this photo, mission specialist Rex Walheim Looks like he's about to have some fun getting ready to drive the M113 armored personnel carrier during training at Kennedy Space Center. An M113 is kept at the foot of the launch pad in case an emergency exit is needed from the launch pad. And this is Walheim's third space flight. He served as a mission specialist on STS-110 in April 2002 and STS-122 in February 2008. And our final crew member here is mission specialist Sandy Magnus. She's shown here as she checks out the fit of her launch and entry suit and helmet during a simulated launch countdown at Kennedy Space Center. STS-135 is also her third space flight. Magnus was a mission specialist for STS-112 in October 2002 and STS-126 in November 2008. During that mission, she transferred to the space station and actually served as a flight engineer and science officer on Expedition 18. She returned home aboard STS-119 in March of 2009 after a four and a half month stay on the station. And the next video is a glimpse of the extensive training the astronauts complete prior to a mission. In April and June, the SDF-135 crew members traveled to Florida to participate in crew equipment interface tests, also called CEIT. Inside the space station processing facility, they became familiar with the payload and hardware they'll be working with and delivering to the station. In late June, the crew members returned to Florida for a full launch dress rehearsal known as the Terminal Countdown Demonstration Test, or TCDT, and related training. After the astronauts arrived at Kennedy Space Center's shuttle landing facility, they began training for various countdown activities. Commander and pilot practiced landing space shuttle Atlantis by flying modified jets known as the Shuttle Training Aircraft. Crew members familiarized themselves with the emergency exit routes of the launch pad, including walkways, slide wire escape baskets, and armored personnel carriers. Finally, just like they will on launch day, the astronauts put on their launch and entry suits and helmets, traveled in the Astrovan to the launch pad, and boarded Atlantis for a launch countdown. The astronauts now are prepared for the launch on Atlantis. 12-day mission to the International Space Station, the final flight of the Space Shuttle program. Okay, well for those of you who like numbers, I got a few more numbers for you. Uh, STS-135 will be the 153rd launch from Launch Complex 39. And this includes 135 shuttle launches, 17 Apollo Saturn V launches, and one Constellation Ares 1X test flight. And of course, STS 135 mission will be NASA's last space shuttle mission and the final space flight of Space Shuttle Orbiter Atlantis. Well, here are the members of the crew take a break from the simulated launch countdown for the traditional group portrait up on the 195 foot level of the launch pad. And behind them, you can see the external tank and one of two solid rocket boosters attached to Atlantis. All right, well, this concludes my portion of the briefing. I uh, hope you enjoyed some of that insight into the crew's training and just the overall look inside what goes into safely launching shuttles and astronauts.
And now I'd like to introduce a final briefer, Mr. Steve Clark, who's currently the Associate Director in the uh, formerly Constellation Project Office, but now the uh, student to be 21st Century Grant Systems Program, where we intend to do some of those things that Joe said and, and go explore space. Um, Steve has worked in many programs here on PSD. He's no stranger, and, um, and I know he will do a great job of giving me some insight into NASA's history and a little bit more about the show. So please welcome Steve Clark. Wildlife 
here uh, very well. We have done our best not to encroach um, any more than necessary into the natural habitat and maintain the natural environment. So we work very closely with the Department of Interior to maintain that balance. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about the history here. Um, our first rocket launch here was out on Cape Canaveral side in 1950. And this is a bumper V-2 rocket that was captured from the Germans at the end of World War II. And we started bringing that hardware over here and testing these rockets so that we can start learning more about them and improving on them. Uh, what I'd like to point out is the thrill seekers here. That, that exhaust is coming towards them pretty quick. So I, I, I would have loved to have been standing there behind them to see what kind of reaction they had and what kind of exhaust they had. Next up. So our first American uh, launch was, uh, of course, Captain Alan Shepard in uh, May 1961. And he rode this Mercury Redstone rocket to an altitude of 119 miles and successfully splashed down into the Atlantic Ocean. This really heralded the first American uh, into space. Next slide. So part of our early space exploration, uh, Captain Shepard kind of blazed the trail. And then in February 1962, upper left is John Glenn. He was the first American to orbit the Earth. And he launched on top of a, an Atlas rocket, which was converted, it was converted intercontinental ballistic. Uh, he did three orbits around the Earth in a little less than five hours, and then successfully splashed down, of course. In the upper right, um, we had some other firsts in the uh, early exploration days, was our first spacewalk. And that's Colonel Ed White doing the first American spacewalk during a Gemini mission. A Gemini followed Apollo, or Mercury, excuse me, uh, as the next stepping stone to get to the moon. And they were two-man crews from that point on. So we learned how to walk in space. We also learned how to rendezvous and dock two spacecraft in orbit. And that was critical to the success of the Apollo space program because we knew we were going to rendezvous in orbit with the command module and the lunar module to go to the moon, undock and land the lander on the moon, then have to redock in lunar orbit and bring the crew back. So that was a critical phase in the early part of the program. And of course, in the center are the first seven American astronauts uh, which flew the Mercury missions. Next slide. So in May 1961, May 25th to be exact, three weeks after Alan Shepard's flight, uh, President Kennedy, uh, at a joint session of Congress, issued a challenge to the nation and to NASA to send humans to the surface of the moon and bring them back safely before the end of the decade of the 60s. Next slide. And that we did. In July 1969, Apollo 11, uh, we landed on July 20th. And as a coincidence, if we launch tomorrow, Atlantis is supposed to land on July 20th of this year, 42 years to the day that we landed on the moon. <coughs> we had successful missions uh, on the moon. You, I think you recall one mission that didn't quite make it. Uh, we made a movie about it. Tom Hanks did a great job in it. Um, and we successfully brought the crew back to Earth even after that emergency. So uh, the Apollo program overall was a very successful program. As we finished up the Apollo program, next slide, the space shuttle program was approved. And uh, in fact, John Young was walking on the moon when they radioed up to him that uh, the president had signed off on the space shuttle program. And so, John Young on the left, Bob Crippen on the right were the first two shuttle astronauts on STS-1. Launched April 12, 1981. 30 years. Next slide. This is a, a, a montage of a tribute to Atlantis of the 33 missions <coughs> of course, STS-135. It flew many memorable missions. Um, it flew many scientific payloads. In fact, I worked a lot of those. We, we launched the uh, Galileo spacecraft that went to Jupiter, uh, the Gamma Ray Observatory, which remained in Earth orbit and did a lot of uh, great scientific research. Uh, that's just to name a few. It was involved with Hubble resurfacing. Um, it was the orbiter that participated in the Shuttle Mir program. And the Mir was the first Russian space station. And we started working with the Russians and uh, visiting Mir before the International Space Station was built. 
Uh, and then, of course, it's, it's uh, gone to the International Space Station and helped build that uh, capability as well. Next slide. Now, this is the final, what we call, rollover uh, of Atlantis. Once it's prepared in the orbiter processing facility or the hangar, it's rolled over to the vertical assembly building or vehicle assembly building to be stacked to the external tank and the solid rocket boosters. And so it's on the transporter that's taken it over. We had to take a moment and uh, take some pictures of the workforce that prepared the vehicle. And you can see the crew, the two uh, crew members in blue on the left and two on the right are the crew members for SDS 135. Next slide. Now here's a picture of Atlantis out of the pad, and I'll try to draw your attention here. This is what we call the payload uh, canister, and that's what we have been taking all of the space station uh, modules out to the launch pad, and we keep it in a controlled environment, and then we put it into what we call the payload changeout room. Then what we do is, once that it's loaded in and the environmental doors are sealed, um, we bring that canister back down, and then we rotate the rotating surface structure around the orbiter. Then we're able to inflate seals and open up the payload bay doors so that then we can load the, the modules, and in this case, Raffaello module, into the payload bay and the orbiter. Once we're there, we secure the doors, we deflate the seals, and then this rotating surface structure will roll back for launch. Next slide. So I'm going to take you through kind of the launch sequence, which you'll see tomorrow. About six seconds before liftoff, the main engines are ignited. And these sparks are the burn off gas. This is by no means what you're going to hear tomorrow. You're really going to hear it tomorrow. You're going to feel it too. with 
with our, the Russians, the Canadians. And, I mean, this is just a sample, the Japanese, uh, all the European nations, um, to, to get this station put together to operate it as a national or a, an international laboratory. Uh, and we're going to continue to use those partnerships to resupply the station uh, with cargo and change out crews. Next slide. This is a picture of Endeavour from the last mission, SDS 134. Um, two crew members went into a Soyuz capsule and undocked from the International Space Station and did a fly around the station. And this is the first time humans had ever seen a space shuttle docked to the space station like this. And it did a pretty extensive fly around to do an inspection of the station, but at the same time take these beautiful pictures of the orbiter docked to the International Space Station. It's just amazing. Next slide. Now this is the current crew of the International Space Station. They're, they're about to get four visitors, hopefully tomorrow. Uh, and so there'll be ten folks up there, uh, which there, again, there's plenty of room uh, to operate up there. And so they continue to do the research that I talked about that. Um, and they will continue to do that. We'll rotate crews through there using the uh, Russian Soyuz capsules to exchange crews and so forth over the next uh, year, few years. Next slide. Let me tell you a little bit more about other things we do with NASA. There's the unmanned or robotic side that uh, called Launch Services Program. And they're in charge of managing all of the NASA unmanned launches. And these are the, the, the scientific probes that go to other planets, such as the Mars rovers. Um, this is kind of a map of where these spacecraft are going. You can see an extensive list underneath Earth. We continue to send up new and improved uh, instruments in orbit to monitor the Earth's climate, um, the oceans. We're learning more and more about um, what kind of effects we humans have had on the Earth and what can we do to counteract some of the, some of the not so good things we've, we've done with the Earth's climate. But then we also, the, the white ones are relatively new uh, missions that are on, on dock. Um, we're going to be launching a probe to Jupiter called Juno later this year. We're launching uh, the next uh, Mars rover uh, later this year as well to land on Mars. And we're also sending a spacecraft called Grail to orbit the moon. Um, we've been to the moon. A lot of people say that. Why do we continue to go there? Well, we spent very little time there. And we really have not sent that many spacecraft to orbit the moon to do detailed mapping uh, of the, the moon's surface and understand more about the moon. So we're going to continue to do that as well. The 21st Century Launch uh, Complex, I never mentioned this, this program is tasked to modernize the Kennedy Space Center. And what I mean by that, and that may sound funny, well, how can it not be modern when launching a space shuttle? Well, we have a lot of facilities here that we have been using since the Apollo days. And we, we've transformed them to support the space shuttle program over the last 30 years. Well, now we're looking at the future of launching multiple rockets out of the Kennedy Space Center, not just NASA rockets. So up here in the upper left is Pad A. Um, and we have two launch pads here, Pad A and Pad B. Shuttle launch up there. Pad B used to look like that, but we've been in the process of taking all of that launch tower infrastructure out. It's expensive to keep that type of structure up, operations and maintenance. And we're taking it down to what we call a clean pad, where there won't be any structure here at all. And what that does, it allows different types of launch vehicles to be transported out to the pad and launched. And we're upgrading all of the fiber optics. We, we still have copper wiring in there because they've been in there for over 30 years. So we're modernizing, we're upgrading to make it uh, more efficient and less uh, costly to operate here at the Kennedy Space Center. Next slide. Commercial crew and cargo. Um, two companies have contracts with NASA currently, SpaceX and the Orbital Sciences Corporation. And they are going to be providing um, cargo transportation, unmanned cargo transportation to the station. So with the shuttle retiring, we need to provide uh, more capability along with our international partners to bring food, water, supplies, um, different parts when things break up at the space station. So 
These two companies are in the process of uh, getting ready to provide those services to NASA. They both have test flights scheduled for this fall. SpaceX has already done one test flight. So they're moving along very well. We hope to bring them online here within the next year to actually start taking cargo up. For uh, commercial crew, again, with Space Shuttle retiring, uh, we are looking to work with our industry partners to uh, establish a capability to take our astronauts and even international astronauts up to the space station and bring them home. Right now we're going to rely on our Russian partners to do that with the Soyuz capsules. We're going to uh, complement that capability with the commercial crew program. And that program is actually here at the Kennedy Space Center and uh, they're moving along very well on getting that capability uh, put in place. Next slide. So what's next beyond that? Well, we're working on exploration plans beyond low Earth orbit. We're going to continue to operate the space station up through 2020 right now. We're still looking at potentially uh, extending it beyond that. But we want to go beyond low Earth orbit. We want to go out there and explore uh, asteroids, potentially use the moon as a test bed, as a stepping stone to go out. Um, eventually get to Mars. Mars has always been a destination I think we've been looking at since the beginning of the space program. Um, so we're in the process now of figuring out what's the best way to do that. What kind of rockets do we need to, to start building to get us beyond low Earth orbit? Next slide. So here is a picture of Atlantis sitting out the pad now, um, which you'll see tomorrow. Um, I think this is actually my last slide. Um, I'm going to end with, we're going to show you a video that's a tribute to the entire space shuttle program. But before I do, uh, I do want to take a moment to say thank you uh, and recognize my colleagues, uh, Joe Dowdy, Deborah Crawl, Layla Dowdy, and the entire guest operations staff that has continually worked uh, tirelessly to put this presentation together and perfect it as we moved along. And so um, I'd like to thank all of them and give them a, a warm round of applause. And it's been my honor and privilege to speak to you today, particularly on, on this day uh, leading up to the last shuttle launch. So on behalf of the outstanding KSC workforce, the entire NASA family, um, we thank you for being here. Enjoy the experience tomorrow. And uh, you all are part of the history here now. So uh, go Atlantis. Go Atlantis.
to tragedy, to triumph once again. Through the space shuttle, we have grown and matured as a spacefaring people. And now we stand prepared to take the next steps on the new frontier. Never in the history of humankind has any endeavor taught us more, taken us farther, launched more dreams, and inspired a generation like the Space Shuttle. Over the last decade, the Space Shuttle has been the platform from which astronauts accomplished the greatest engineering and construction project in the history of mankind, a state-of-the-art national research laboratory orbiting our planet. John Young, the first commander of the Space Shuttle and the first man ever to fly an untested spacecraft into orbit, exclaimed after landing Columbia on the dry lake bed at Edwards Air Force Base in California. As we anticipate the final flights of the world's first and only reusable spacecraft, we pause to reflect on what is, indeed, the world's greatest flying machine. The Space Shuttle.